Welcome to our, our panel. Our topic is the business of TV everywhere. Uh, I'm Jonathan Weitz, partner of the media practice at IBB Consulting. We're a strategy and execution consulting company working with cable networks, studios, uh, MVPDs, and technology companies. I think right now is a really timely uh, time for us to be talking about this topic. If you look at some of the recent deals, for example, the Disney Comcast deal, uh, NBC doing live streaming and talking about a large uh, majority of that being authenticated, I think there are some real positive signs out there right now for TV Everywhere. However, uh, I think there's a long way to go before the vision is completely realized. So um, I'm really excited to have such a great uh, distinguished panel of experts with us today. Uh, I'll have them introduce themselves and maybe we'll just start with a short intro from each of our panelists, then we'll jump into questions and we'll leave time for all of your questions. Go ahead. Okay. So I'm Keith Wines, I'm the VP of Marketing of Elemental Technologies and Elemental is a encoding and transcoding vendor, so we power many of the TV everywhere and over the top deployments that you may have heard about, so HBO Go, uh, Comcast, Xfinity, uh, ESPN, uh, the Score Center applications, any on-demand content that's produced by them. And we're doing a decent amount around the Olympics this summer as well for live streaming. Hi, I'm Bruce Eisen, VP <coughs> Online Content Development and Strategy for Dish Network. Dish is the third largest uh, pay TV operator in the country. I'm responsible for uh, Dish Online, our online uh, video entertainment portal and content acquisition for uh, all the on-demand content cross-platform, so set-top box, dish online, iPad app, and so forth. Hi, I'm Seth Metch from a and &E Networks, um, where I am the Vice President of Digital Media Council and the Legal and Business Affairs Group. I've also worked in business development roles, and I basically focus on any type of deal that we do that involves anything digital, so involving digital distribution of video, um, and our websites, apps, games, which are probably the most fun thing and sort of hit all across. And I've been on many emails with Bruce, and he's never met me before. So we'll see what happens. Here. Hopefully, don't we don't kill each other. Hi, I'm. Um, too loud. Um, I'm Michael Fisher. I'm with uh, Sling Slingbox. Most of you probably know Slingbox from the uh, retail consumer electronics device we have. We also have a focus on providing scalable solutions to um, MVPDs to, to sort of port over that sling experience, that TV everywhere experience, and have it delivered through um, tier one, tier two operators uh, in North America. Great, thank you. I think we'll get a really interesting combination of perspectives from folks on this panel. I want to start with general questions, and then we'll zoom into a few specific things, really focused around the business of TV everywhere, but We'll also get a bit into some of the technology aspects. I think a great place to start, really, is what does TV Everywhere mean to you? Because I think there's you know, different, some different interpretations um, from folks on this panel. And what do you think it will take for it to really get big? I'm um, first? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I, I mean, I think the traditional um, view of TV every, Everywhere is really the ability to use the authentication that the particular distributor has um, and allow the content to come directly from the content owner um, and use a single login, obviously, to access that content. In order, in order for it to be really big, I mean, I think one of the things that we have to start thinking about is a, having a more global view of this. Um, we tend in, in these sessions, uh, Streaming Media East or Streaming Media West, to have a very uh, US-centric approach. But I think part of the discussion today is kind of what's happening on a global basis. Um, and I think you're going to start to see scenarios where uh, traditional TV everywhere applications that you think of in the U.S. start to migrate um, not only across, you know, geographies within the U.S. itself and across the um, distribution rights of particular um, content distributors, but also crossing international boundaries. I think some of the aspirations that you see from um, some of the larger players in particular are not just about owning their own markets within region or their, their own uh, kind of national markets, but also on a global scale. And I think once that starts to happen, there's going to be uh, quite a battle uh, on a global basis for TV everywhere. Well, for DISH, our goal is to be able to make the content available to our subscribers 
wherever they want to see it, on whatever do device they want to see it, whenever they want to see it. Um, that's the goal. Not 100% there yet, but we're making great progress. Our friends at A&E are very hopeful in that. <laughs> um, and you know, there, there's work to be done. There's a lot of issues to make that happen. Legal business, not not on the tech side. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll talk about more of those. But it's uh, rights issues are complex. A lot of the deals that are in place, either be it between Dish and the programmer, or the programmer and their content supplier, are older deals that never even contemplated this. So, you know, how do you make that happen? Uh, and, there's business issues as to how does the payment work, what is the payment, how does the ad revenue flow, how do, how do you make that happen. So we're all moving in the right direction. There's certainly been a lot of progress in the last year and the year before that. Uh, and I anticipate there'll be great progress the rest of this year and next year. It's hard because I'm lucky I'm not fourth. That's why I'm being third because as I wrote down points, you guys kept saying them. Um, I'd say the first thing that's important to me is that what TV Everywhere means is the relationship as a cable network that I am going to have with a cable or satellite provider, an MSO, to distribute content everywhere to our paying subscribers. I think that's an important thing. It is not a service like Aereo or Nimble TV, which is creating their own business model, charging people and doing something just without you know, acquiring rights or doing any type, you know, any type of authority. I think that's important to me, thinking from a legal perspective, because a lot of things I think of about our that sort of that we have to really figure out our rights issues, royalty issues, and things like that. Because, for instance, certain programs that we have on our networks, we have programs that we own, and we have the rights to distribute them in all media any which way you can. We have programs we license. We didn't necessarily license the rights to distribute them to mobile devices or over the internet, and we have to figure those out. Same thing, stuff that's produced under guild and union contracts. There's royalty <laughs> issues. Um, there's royalty issues for the residuals for the talent when you distribute over different media. And then music. Music is licensed and, and the, the revenue works differently over different media. And these are sort of, it's an interesting thing because the TV business is a really old business from a from media perspective because the rights have been carved up in lots of little different things. There's domestic versus international rights. And when we look at TV everywhere, we have to find a way to take all those separate buckets and put everything back together. And it's more of a challenge for older programming than for newer programming. I'd say the other big impediment is measurement. Um, measurement of viewing and measurement of viewing and how it's used for ad sales. A&E is a, is a basic cable network. So unlike HBO, which you're paying a subscription fee, you're not watching commercials, they're getting their money from you. We need to have people sort of our revenue model involves people watching our channels linearly, which you know, I know many people don't do as much anymore and watching those commercials because we're getting revenue from subscription fees and from advertisers. And the inherent you know, thing that we have to figure out is how to make <coughs> our business model evolve because that's the, mon the money we get from those two sources, the money we use to invest in content. And we need to find a way to recoup our in in money and make the same amount of revenue so that we can continue to invest in content to distribute over the different um, media. Uh, I think you've covered all my points as well. Um, you know, I, 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 I guess I would echo some of the earlier points. I think the Sling delivered uh, TV Everywhere experience is very consistent with the goals I think we heard earlier. It's, it's, the, it's connecting the consumers to the content they want to watch that they've paid for, regardless of where they are on, on what device, right? I think that's sort of a high level goal. I think. Uh, from the Sling perspective, the way we do that is a little bit different, right? We basically take, we basically have technology that takes the experience that the user, uh, the subscriber has on their couch with that remote and port it over to an iPad or to a laptop or to another TV, frankly. And so, you know, I think the one distinction from our perspective is that it's, that it includes all content, um, whether it be live content, all the channels that the consumer pays for, or DVR or VOD, et cetera. Uh, and I think the other th distinction is that, um, you know, while many people are watching, consuming content online when they want to, I think that for the majority of folks, um, you know, four or five hours of television viewing a day happens in front of the TV, and how people discover and consume content is based on that experience. And I think one of the things that we try to bring through in the in the in sort of the sling model is is, is building on that. Uh, experience and, and, and connecting consumers to what they the experience they already know. 
Um, but that doesn't preclude any other solution, right? It doesn't preclude authenticated. We we can deliver. You know, one of the things one of the things that you 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 open up the trade magazines every other day and you see a new online video service launched by this content provider or that content provider or by this operator or that operator. Um, the consumer has a myriad of different choices and they have to go to different um, destinations to get those different apps, et cetera. Um, what what we focus on is sort of pulling that together in one unified experience for an MVPD. So that you can integrate, um, if the con if the operator has a relationship with this content partner or that part content partner or their own VOD um, assets, plus they have a Sling solution, we work to sort of integrate that into one uh, one one experience that pulls all that all that content together. Great, thank you. Uh, Bruce, want to come back and follow up with you, and then um, Seth as well, probably uh, on the the the. Where we're at today, it seems like a, there's a good amount of you know, great experiments going on uh, with TV everywhere. And as we're transitioning to really run this as a business, what does that mean uh, to you and, and what do you want to get out of it? What would you say, uh, Bruce, is success for you in terms of running a TV everywhere business? Well, I wouldn't say that, we're, that we are or that we are looking to run a TV everywhere business. Right? I mean, that's a component of, what, of our business, but it's not a TV everywhere business. Our business is to provide TV programming to our subs. Um, and again, it's however, wherever, whenever. So for us, it's, we've made great progress, and we're, we're happy with where we are. Um, frankly, I would say there's maybe one other pay TV operator who's doing the type of stuff that we're doing, uh, and that's it. So we're, we're far ahead of everyone else. Um, but to say you know additional uh, success would it, it's more content, right? It, it's it's working with our content providers, working with others in the ecosystem, to really have more content, uh, more immediately available, again across all the devices. And then Seth, your your perspective, what does success look like I mean, it's, for it's you? A, it's the same thing. It's maintaining you know interest in our brands and our shows and people watching and maintaining our viewership. Um, but, you know, ultimately to monetize them because that's what we do. So success is being able to do that and being able to provide TV programming to people wherever they want to be, but, you know, finding a business model work that works to support, you know, the creation of that programming. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Bruce and Michael, I think what you're doing with the user experience, uh, maybe if you could tell us a little bit about that in terms of, um, you know, the, the Sling, the, the Dish Remote Access app, um, what does the user experience look like? Because I think you know we, we have a perspective that the, the user experience really matters in terms of uh, you know making a great authenticated uh, you know uh, experience for consumers. Yeah. So our iPad app is a sister companion to our website, Dish Online, um, and I'll talk about Dish Online first because that's the parent, right? So from there, there is uh, content you can view in front of the wall. You don't need to be a dish sub. You can come and there's a ton of content. You can enjoy full-length movies and TV shows. If you are smart enough to be a dish sub, there is a lot more additional content that you can watch. You log in and, you know, if you're an HBO subscriber, there's thousands of content. If you're an A&E sub and, and so forth. You can set your DVR, which uh, I think is pretty cool because I'm oftentimes not in front of my TV when I'm finding out about interesting content. I'm I flew here from LA and I'm up 30,000 feet. I'm reading the paper and I'm doing email at the same time using GoGo, -Go, which kind of sucks. But um, and, and I'm reading this article about some TV show that's on that I did not record. Well, I literally went to Dish Online and set my DVR from 30,000 feet so when I get home tomorrow I can watch the show. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, and you can rent movies for delivery into your set top box. So that's what you can do on Dish Online. And, and if you're Sling enabled, you can watch uh, live TV and recorded DVR TV. So for the iPad app, it's to mimic that to the extent possible, um, mostly on a rights issue in terms of possible. So a lot of the content that's in front of the wall uh, is the broadcast nets, and, and we get that from Hulu. We do not have the right to put that on the iPad app. So that's not on there. But we do have the right for the DVR control. We do have the right for HBO Go, as an example. Uh, you know, we do have the right to so you can order movies. So the user experience 
goal is to create on the iPad app everything to the extent possible that you can do online. Um, in terms of the specific details of that as a product and the decisions that were made as to what's where and so forth, I'm going to let Michael talk about that because uh, Sling is part of EchoStar, and they're the company that uh, actually built that for us. Yeah, I, mean, I actually don't have too much to add to that. I think I think the Jonathan kind of touched on this earlier, which is the MVPD has access to multiple content sources, and in the case of Dish, the customer has access to their live TV, so it's just one more, right? And there's user experience issues to manage, et cetera. Um, our goal is to really pull together all those disparate content sources into one seamless as possible um, um, user experience where the, where the subscriber can navigate if it's a blockbuster asset, if it's a stars asset, if it's an encore asset, um, or if it's something off of the DVR, or if they're discovering something as, as Bruce talked about and wanting to set that DVR. Our goal, our goal is to really marry the ultimate, the, the, end, the, the end game is a consumer consuming that content, right? Um, but the challenge is bringing together authenticated and, and linear and DVR assets all into one. And so that's really our goal in, that, in, those, in those applications. Uh, you know, I think one of the interesting questions for us to ask is this kind of trade off or the push and pull of, you know, the experience of aggregation and the experience of the actual content itself. I've heard HBO in another session say that, you know, in their TV everywhere approach, and I think HBO Go is a good example of that. It's the most well known example. It's, very well distributed with the with the content uh, folks with the MVPDs, um, they basically said that I think four out of every five of their views uh, is not done on the traditional TV any longer. So it's done through an app. So it might be on a TV set. It might be through a, a Netflix or a HBO Go smart uh, smart TV, or it may be on an iPad. And that's kind of showing that the the experience and increasing the level of the experience is a little bit more about the app than about the aggregation of that content, uh, at least in that case. And it may be a corner case because HBO Go is, is quite unique in terms of, you know, its aggressiveness in this market and its innovation in the market. But, but it's kind of an interesting question. Just another thing to point out about HBO and the difference between HBO Go and the broadcast and basic cable networks is HBO doesn't have advertising as part of its revenue model. Yeah. So if you watch, HBO makes the same amount of money from you whether you watch on your iPad or watch on TV, there's no impact on that. There's no impact on their revenue, which means their investment in programming can be the same. There's a good argument that you know, if they enhance their subscriptions and have more subscriptions because of their apps, they'll have more revenue to invest in programming. Yeah. You know, the, the key is looking at, as this is the bit, one of the few um, panels here, it's the business of something, is to really look for each network and each type of programmer what their business model is and see how the different viewing things actually fit with their business model. So for ad-driven ad networks, what, what does that mean for you in terms of well, your... Think, you, know, you have sort of the age-old Nielsen problem. Um, not saying Nielsen's a problem. You can come to your own conclusions. But you know, people, app agencies buy commercials on television based on Nielsen ratings. So our networks are Nielsen rated, and that's what they, what they look at. Now, Nielsen does not capture... In everywhere, Nielsen, they, they sort of a little old fashioned with, um, you know, their panels and people reporting and, you know, their people meter, you know, all these things. But it's a sample, and Nielsen measures a sample. Nobody, I think, really knows if that sample overmeasures or undermeasures, but people are comfortable that the business works, and I don't think anyone really wants to know. Um, but the, when you look at something like the iPad, and the iPad's an interesting thing. So if you are a Nielsen family and you watch stuff in websites on your computer, you can install the Nielsen software on your computer. Now, don't know if you want to do that because whereas the, on television they look at what you're watching on television, I think everybody does something on the web that they don't necessarily want to have tied to them and announced for survey results. Um, so you know, that's interesting on the web, so is the sample as valid on the web? The, the iPad is really the key here. Is, so no third party has software that runs in the background on the iPad. Apple doesn't allow that in its ecosystem. <laughs> So if Nielsen was going to effectively measure, let's say, iPad viewing, every single iPad app would have to have Nielsen embedded into it and turned on. And every single, you know, and the same thing if you're watching like HTML5 video in the Safari browser or another browser, that browser would have to have that. We're, we're just not there yet. What about Comscore? Are they able to measure on the iPad? Um, Comscore, I think, can, it, just like everything else, it's got to be in the app. So. 
you know, I could tag my app with that. But the problem is, there's no, unlike Nielsen, there's no universally accepted measurement of the advertising industry. And advertisers buy Nielsen. Right, on TV, right? But like Hulu, as an right, example, is selling based on Comscore. Yes, but, but TV advertising dollars and Hulu advertising dollars are two different ballparks. No, no, I, I agreed. Yeah. I guess my question is, couldn't, and I'm not saying you should or shouldn't, but, you know, couldn't a, uh, a basic cable net, yeah. um, you know, sell the ads for TV the way you're currently doing it, mm -hmm. and then sell the stuff that's going to be online more the way Hulu does, you know, based on a comm score? Yes, but those are going to be, the, the bigger revenue is on TV. We don't necessarily want to pull people away from TV I see. To, to online. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can finally see it. But the big ad buys and TVs are done based on Nielsen ratings. I want to follow up on this discussion around the, some of the devices and apps that we're talking about. It, it seems that consumers really want to be able to watch authenticated content on whichever device they choose, iPads, Xboxes, et cetera. Um, how do you make some of the choices between some of those devices, apps, OS platforms? Mm -hmm. It seems that there are upfront capital <coughs> questions, and then there is also it seems a lot of ongoing operational overhead and cost questions about getting out and, and distributing to all these different platforms. Um, how do you prioritize and how do you make those decisions? And are, are you doing anything that's making some of those costs more manageable for your companies? Uh, that's a great question. From the, from the Sling perspective, we've been around for, for seven years. And um, long before there was an iPhone or an Android device, we, we had smartphone apps. We had Symbian apps, we had Palm apps, we had original Windows phone apps. Um, uh, so we, we rushed to develop one of those platforms, and we even had BlackBerry. And um, it, it's a big question, because uh, not only is it just the, the, the OS, but sometimes the OS will fork, and there's multiple versions of that OS, and so if you create an app that works on one version of one OS, it may not work on another. Um, we have something like 71 devices we support right now, um, and I can tell you it's it's a it's a big challenge. And I and I look at the the operators and and think about some of them who are creating their own shops to create these apps. And um, I think if you keep it to a couple, to a few, um, that's probably a sensible uh, way to to approach it. But um, what does that mean? Does that mean Android and iOS only? Does that mean precluding yourself from developing something on a game console or um, on a connected TV? Um, so we, we, we look at, you know, sort of, um, we look at trends a lot. We look at adoption of individual devices and OSs and start to make that cost-benefit analysis as early as we possibly can before we put resources behind um, um, creating a particular app, but, but it's a great question because it's it's uh, um, as as there's more and more adoption of these devices, um, it, keeping up with every flavor of uh, device and OS is, is not easy. And this is an area where um, you know, from the elemental perspective, we're kind of, I guess, a little bit in the cost equation of, of this whole you know business uh, proposition. And our customers in general, if you, look, if you look deeper into the technology side and the operational side, in general, the compression techniques that are used for all over the top and TV everywhere have standardized on a single um, you know, uh, underlying video uh, compression codec, which is H.264. But then around all of that, you have customization that happens for iOS and you know Adobe Dynamic Flash and, and Microsoft Smooth Streaming and now Dash, and not to mention Ultraviolet and DECE and all these other things that are happening. And right now we're in a land grab where there's a lot of chaos. Um, I think over time those those elements will converge. There still won't necessarily be a convergence on you know the the end player side um, all the way to you know having two dominant players, but. I think for most folks that are getting into this business, they think about it really logically. You know, they need to get on the iPad. That's a no-brainer. And then it begets a couple questions beyond that. But you have to decide kind of you're not going to go to, you're not gonna go to 300. Um, it just doesn't make sense. There is a tail that happens, and you've got you to gotta kind of pick your battles and decide where you're going to have strength and where you're just going to and where you're going to put a lot of effort in and where you're not going to put as much effort in. So maybe if I can follow up with you then on, on what you're doing internationally with the Olympics, can you tell us about 
you know, the business behind that? Is it authenticated? Uh, and are you seeing some challenges, or, or you know, how is it going so far as you're deploying the uh, well, that content? Yeah, we'll find out in August. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, the Olympics, the Olympics are a real interesting case, right? It's a bit of an anomaly in that it only happens every few years, and and the amount of interest in that event is obviously huge. But I think there's some lessons to be learned in terms of the value of that content. Um, you know, the IOC's charter, one of the the bylaws of the charter is to expand and, and really get the visibility of the Olympics to as many people in the world as possible. Um, you know, that started out obviously with just a stadium. It went to radio in, I think, the 30s. and went to broadcast TV um, in, the, in the late 40s type of time frame. And it's gradually expanded to, you know, a decade ago, able to stream it on the, on the PC and whatnot. Um, and so their desire is to get to as many platforms as possible. And, the, and the way, one of the ways that happens is each local broadcaster um, in mo the majority of, of countries, uh, not necessarily the developing countries, but the ones that are a, a little bit um, higher up in the economic scale, uh, have rights to do both broadcast and digital delivery. Um, and so there is basically distribution that's happening, um, you know, elementals involved in, in the UK, as well as throughout all of Latin America, without Brazil, um, throughout Europe, Canada. And, you know, there is a authentication process that happens in certain instances. In other instances, the IOC is saying there doesn't need to be authentication. So in uh, areas of the world where maybe the infrastructure is not as, as strong as in, um, you know, some of the more advanced countries, there, there are streams that are made available uh, to individuals that happen to have phones because phones are more pervasive than obviously than TV sets. And so there's no authentication at all. The, the streams may not be live, but almost any, anyone in the world with a smartphone can get access to the Olympics, whereas you, know, if you think just even six years ago, four to six years ago, that was not the case. So it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll turn to your questions in just a moment. Uh, just have a couple additional questions for the, for the panel. Um, I want to ask you about some of the startups in this space. If, if you look at companies like Aereo and Nimble TV, what do the things that we're talking about around the business of TV Everywhere, some of the technology implications, what does this mean for some of the companies like uh, Nimble and Aereo? Are they uh, com direct competitors? Are they potential um, people that you might cooperate with? Or are they just um, you know, small and, and you don't yet need to worry about players like that? I mean, Nibble TV doesn't really, I mean, Aereo doesn't affect me as directly because that's only the broadcast networks. And for those of you that don't, don't know, Aereo has little farms with lots of little antennas and you rent your own little antenna and they broadcast your um, programming to you wherever you want. I, you know, they're being sued by a lot of parties. That, that will be an interesting thing. Um, I think that's disruptive if it is determined to be legal because it's sort of the whole retrans business changes overnight. So whereas now, the MSOs and satellite companies have to pay to retransmit the local um, channels. You could sort of, you know, a, a dish or a cable vision or a Comcast could set up the same thing and no longer pay the over there networks for retransmission. And then you've taken a piece of their revenue, that's money they invest in programming. You don't have as much programming or as, you know, high quality programming. Um, Nimble TV is an interesting one. Nimble TV purports that it it's a reseller, it's buying a subscription um, from from the, the cable or satellite provider who they, and then what they're doing is basically they have a server form somewhere, they're doing it with a dummy address and then they'll transmit it to you and they're gonna add on 10 or 20 bucks. And you know that doesn't really work either because I'm sure your end user license agreement when someone subscribes doesn't allow them to resell at a plus $20 fee. You know, for that to be legal, the, you know, Nibble TV would have to make deals with the MSOs, and then the MSOs would have to make deals with the providers, because the MSOs don't really have that right to grant, and that's why there's <coughs> negotiations between the channels and, and the carriers for, you know, for TV everywhere. So basically, you, you can't sort of just take someone else, in some, you can't just sort of take someone else's programming and decide, well, it's okay, this is where people want it, at least in, in my opinion. You have to, have to work with the rights holders and work with the people and work within the system. And you, we're receptive to new business models, but you can't just take it and say, we're going to do with it what we want. Bruce, can I get your perspective on this? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
You know, it's interesting. If you look back a decade ago to when IPTV first started, there was this discussion as well when the, a lot of rural uh, telephone companies started to get into the, or had the desire to get into the video business. And one of the ways that they they dealt with it was, I think, a little bit more legitimate in that they went out and bought small cable companies that actually owned the right to put the video transmission over, over a network. It happened to be a different type of network. Um, but, you know, that's a more legitimate way probably of, of gaining the rights than just going and saying, hey, we're just going to go and mark it up and, you know, we're a small provider. Um, we can disaggregate, you know, disaggregate the channels and make a markup on it. It's, it's not, I don't think it's likely to actually to fly. I guess the, the only thing I would add to that is to, you know, maybe look at it from the positive side and, and you know, is that um, it, it does demonstrate the demand for TV everywhere, right? It, 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 you know, some of, the, some of these attempts may be proven vi uh, legally viable or not, um, but there's clear, uh, folks looking at this market are clearly saying there's demand here and we need to come up with solutions to go after that market. Whether one is the right way to do it or not, um, I think it sort of justifies the focus of what we're talking about here today, what we're talking about TV everywhere. There's a market for it, and there's more and more consumers shifting their eyeballs from a television to an iPad, and um, there's gonna, there are going to be players that go after different solutions to deliver, to deliver that experience. Right, and, and that will be part of the competitive nature of television. We compete with each other on content, the, the networks, and other program for us, and we'll compete with each other on accessibility. It's, you know, but we get to choose how we compete. Great, thank you. Um, let's turn to your questions. Yes, in the front. So what about uh, TV everywhere in terms of uh, worldwide distribution? Uh, I mean, uh, in Argentina, I'm from Argentina, and Netflix has launched last year. Um, uh, I realize that uh, I'm using here my uh, Netflix Argentina account, uh, the catalog is not from the Argentinian one, it's the US one. So the question is, how about to get uh, a TV everywhere in terms of worldwide distribution as a possibility to extend the business for content owners and even for devices? So the question is around, uh, how do we get to international distribution of this business model? Yeah. I think that'll be very difficult because typically the rights for this programming are sold on a territory by territory basis. And in device, also. Well, it's not so much the device, but you know, whoever has the rights to the piece of content in the U.S. probably does not have it in Argentina, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing a deal with the, a U.S. person, and they're in the U.S. and they're getting it, you know, great, but if they take a vacation in Argentina, I can't send the content down there, and, and vice versa. So um, I don't see that changing significantly anytime soon. And, and to add on to what you said is if the U.S., let's say, distributor, let's say, if the U.S. programmer had the rights for worldwide, again, the revenue is in television right now, odds are that they've licensed the rights in Argentina to someone else. Right. So they may have had it, but now they've granted a license to Argentinian TV, and you, you grant those licenses on You're not competing with your own licensee because then you're not going to get paid a lot for your license. And that's where industry consolidation happens. So if you look at UPC, UPC originally was a, you know, mm -hmm. basically in one country. I don't think they're in one country anymore. Uh, if you look at Telefonica, um, there's a there's a there's definitely a consolidation that's starting to happen in the service provider space. It's on both the telecom side as well as the as the cable side, um, and I I think that's going to continue. I don't think it's going to I don't think it's going to slow down, and so that could potentially enable it. Yes, in the back, please. Yeah, I wonder how um, the TV everywhere model is addressing consumer demands. Is there finding it for uh, segregation and personalized content sets and so forth? To repeat the question, just for the benefit of the, the camera. Um, so your question is around where are we at today with personalization of authenticated content? More or less, yes. Well, I, I can't speak to the, the authenticated content piece, but I think... Um, from our model, where we're, the TV Everywhere experience we're delivering is based off of the consumer set-top box and package choice. And so from a personalization perspective, what they view on their sling-powered MVPD app, they're going to view on at their home television. So it's and, and they're going to have access to the DVR assets that they set up. 
So from a personalization perspective, that's, that's what we aim to deliver. And if you, if you look at something, I'll go back to the Olympics. Um, you know, in the U.S., it's going to be authenticated uh, by NBC. And that already in and of itself is a, is a bit of personalization happening right on the fly. If you look back a decade ago, you got whatever you got. You know, what, the, what NBC decided was important to the U.S. market is what you saw on, you know, Channel, channel 4 or whatever. Um, if you go to any other country in that time period 10 years ago, it was usually a much wider view. You know, you would be seeing handball and, you know, things that are just a lot more, a lot more, yeah, European, yeah, yeah, see, exactly. Um, you would see that, but, you know, with, with over-the-top delivery and with, you know, a version of TV everywhere that's going to happen with the Olympics this year, you're going to be able to choose, you know, from 24 live venues exactly what you want to see. It's not personalized down to your you know, very specific niche, but it's giving you an, an enormous amount of choice because it's delivered over IP instead of a constrained bandwidth network. Follow up there. Are they saying essentially satisfaction, consumer satisfaction within that model then, or is, are you seeing increasing the demand and you know, pushback on, on wanting more disaggregated OTT tech content? Well, I think w when you talk about o OTT, you're sort of separating from TV ever. TV ever is authenticated. OTT is something else, and I think, at least now, from what I see, is a lot of that OTT demand is, you know, captured by over the top. For for those of you who don't know OTT, and sort of over the, well, we we'll go into the semantics of another time, but the the is a lot of that is satisfied by Netflix and iTunes, I think. And what, what we do is you know, we put a lot of our programming sort of in a second window, just like DVD has always been a second window into Netflix and iTunes. So yes, if you're willing to wait a little while to watch it, you can get it in that in that way, personalized, you know, disaggregated. Yes, right there. Um, my question's for Michael and Seth. Um, so isn't kind of you're going back to Aereo and Nimble TV, aren't they kind of going through the same issues that Sling went through, you know, legally a few years ago where they're kind of claiming to be a technology reseller well, and they're not they don't they're not messing with the rights. <coughs> This whole point where you know you go on vacation to another country, with sling you can take your content with you as long as you know you pay for it once, you can take it with you anywhere. I guess I would compare sling more to you know, to to an sort of an an old school metaphor. Sling is more like a VHS. Um, they're selling you something, and what you are actually watching is your cable box that you are authorized to have. You know, as a consumer, you don't need an additional right to do that. I think it, it's a different piece. A company needs a right to resell that. And you can record your show and take your VHS tape with you. And it's, well, I mean, you know, th there will be arguments, but it, it's, it's, I think, in a very different place than someone else taking the signal <clears throat> of my channel and reselling it without having a relationship with it. Uh, Seth's legal terms are running, uh, rubbing off on me, but I would say just to correct the record. So Sling's been around for about seven years, and um, we've never been sued. I, I think early, early on in... There are questions and maybe some sable rattling. I think depending, uh, to Seth's point earlier, depending on what type of content genre or business model your content is in, you might view sling as not helpful or helpful, right? Um, but there's been no legal, and I, and I agree with Seth. Our, our perspective is the consumer is paying for this content, um, and we're essentially giving them a long jumper cable from the TV to an iPad, wherever that iPad happens, happens to be. The second thing I would add is the distinction with Sling is that it's not multicast or broadcast. It's point to point, right? So, there's, so when you sign up for Sling with, with Dish, for example, it's not as if 150 of your best friends are watching something. It's the consumer, it's the subscriber watching the content they paid for. Yes? Uh, so a question for Bruce specifically. Um, you know, recently, you guys announced that you're going to be letting your AMC contract expire. Um, and uh, 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 given how that same content is viewed with increasing ratings on TV, it's also viewed uh, pretty well on Netflix, is, is the fact that you're letting that content expire and it's not as valuable to you a reflection on Dish in particular? Or is there an extrapolation on the fact that you can get it electronically and what that means for KTV? Well, our chairman has... Uh publicly said that he believes that because it's available in other places, it's less valuable to us. Got it. And, and is there a, would you like to have that content available, you know, electronically, like digitally? 
Um, so I mean, everything's digital. You know, I'm just curious why is a good piece of what is considered to be good content um, not that valuable to you know the third largest paid TV subscriber. Uh, it's not a matter of is it valuable or not. It's you know what what is the specific cost, and I obviously can't go into that conversation here. Um, but again, Charlie has said that because it's available in so many other ways, the specific cost that is being asked of us is not worthwhile to us and our subscribers. So we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, yes, over there. Yeah, you've had your so, hand up. Um, you know, certainly there's a bad rush to you know, alternative devices. The li but the living room, you know, giving you the ideal TV experience in the living room, you've got a big TV, you've got surround sound, you've got 3D, you've got this kind of premium experience that people expect. Um, and of course, right now, it's quality of service more than anything on you know, tablets and phones, getting anything through them. The question is, what is it going to be about quality of experience? How do you make that experience as close to that living room experience as possible? So the question, uh, just to repeat it, is how do, uh, how, where are we at in terms of the quality and, and how are we, are we able to more closely replicate what we're expecting to see in terms of great quality on linear um, or on demand uh, on your TV? I think we're there. Uh, for the most part. I think the quality of the uh, internet delivered video on an iPad app, for instance, or a laptop, uh, is, is very, very high. There's different technical things that we, we, you know, we all do to achieve that. Some, frankly, do it better than others. Nobody as good as us. Um, so I would say it's right there. I, I would say that it depends, it depends on how you how you um, consider the experience. You used uh, you know, home theater and surround sound and the couch. Um, um, you know, I think that's going to be hard to replicate on an iPad, right, um, to some extent, right? But I think that maybe there's a trade-off between some of those things and the convenience of having the ability to choose when and where I watch, right? And so I think from a video quality perspective, I think we're, we're, if we're there or if we're, we're not, we're getting close. Um, you know, I don't know that we'll ever have popcorn and, and the whole, the whole, the whole living room experience. But I think that you're, um, you know, many folks, frankly, don't have the time to sit down in front of the couch and view, you know, three minutes of Sports Center or five minutes of CNBC. But they're in an airport, and that form factor and that time and place and that choice um, is very important to them, and maybe not the home theater experience. I'm a big watcher of stuff on my iPad, watch HBO, Netflix, Showtime, and all that. And I would say probably the one bar I think the experience is great, it's a bandwidth issue. And I think one of the things that you'll see going forward, is, you know, sometimes it, cra it craps out when I'm in my house. That has to do with my home Wi-Fi, which is sort of outside the programmer's control. But you will see, and it's been the issue, I think it's been used a lot with Comcast, is how the, the Internet service providers are going to treat data and... I'm one who believes that your data, your, your broadband data will eventually be metered just like your electricity and, and everything else, and, and that will have an impact. I think the other piece that we didn't talk about, which I think improves the quality, which sort of fits with TV anyway, is second screen apps. And we're doing more and more with second screen apps that, you know, they're great for things like sports and, and things like that, but even with shows that actually sync up with what's on your TV and you sort of get to interact somehow with the show while you're watching, that your show's on the big screen, you're interacting somehow on the small screen, which is sort of a cool way to engage people. And I do a lot in games with you know, what they call gamification, and you can really take that engagement and gamification and involve the, you know, whether it's a, a mystery solving or a reality competition show, involve the viewer in the show with a second screen app. I think we'll have to end our questions there, if you don't mind, so everybody can get over to lunch, uh, but want to give a great big um, hand to our panelists. It's a really great discussion. Thank you.